The Supreme Court of Canada ruled against Ottawa's Bill C-69, which is the legislation on the environmental effects of major developments. Five of the seven judges ruled that most of it was unconstitutional because it seeks to regulate activities within provincial jurisdiction. Now, to chat about this and other hot-button issues which are impacting Albertans is Alberta Premier Daniel Smith, who joins us now from Calgary. Premier Smith, welcome to Bridge City News. Thanks, Alan. Now, you look at this as a victory, but Federal Environment Minister Stephen Gabot says the 5-2 ruling is just the opinions of the judges, and his government's going to, well, we're going to move ahead anyway, move forward anyway. Your thoughts? Well, they're wrong. I mean, the way the Supreme Court works is that you, as a province, put forward a reference case to your own Court of Appeal, which we did, and we won that, and then it goes on to the Supreme Court, and we won that as well. And so the federal government needs to read the case. They need to make sure that they're internalizing what it says, because it's, it's it was a pretty harsh ruling. It uh, essentially says they've been acting illegally for the last four years. They've been now operating outside the Constitution, which is the highest law in the land. And they have an expectation that, of cooperative federalism. That's the principle on which our country is built. And I can tell you that uh, we will be invoking and waving around that Supreme Court judgment every time the federal government steps out of their lane. So what will this really mean for Alberta's energy sector? It will mean that, once again, we have the authority to be able to, to approve our own projects within our own borders. The, the, federal government, uh, the federal government has a very limited role in being able to do environmental assessments. The court said that if it's a federal project, it has to be on federal land, federally funded, or international. Anything that is within the borders of Alberta, so our oil sands projects, our SAGD projects, if we're developing our generation projects, transmission lines within our province, uh, pipelines within our province, highways within our province, all of those now are firmly within provincial jurisdiction, and we intend to tell the world that Alberta is open for business. A recent report from the University of Calgary School of Public Policy says that there really needs to be an inquiry into the actions of the Alberta Energy regulator. Our province appears to still have a huge orphan well problem. How do you think this will be addressed? Well, I can tell you I've uh, identified this problem going all the way back to 1997 when I was doing landowner advocacy, and I'm very concerned about it. I'm concerned that landowners will feel like if a company goes uh, bankrupt and they have a bunch of inactive wells, that they're going to be left holding the bag for that. We have a number of projects that were built in the even the 50s and the 60s that still haven't been cleaned up. So I've been advocating on this for a very long time. It's part of the reason why I commissioned David Yeager to do a review of our energy policy with a view to how do we accelerate some of this cleanup? How do we get to final reclamation certificates? How do we make sure that landowners get their land back? So we're, we're in the process us now of trying to figure out where the the problems are at the Alberta Energy Regulator, and it's um it's not it's a little complicated because part of the approval process resides with the Ministry of Environment, part resides with the Ministry of Energy, part of it resides with the regulator. So uh, this uh, we're going to have a report that gives us a, a clearer pathway to how we can make these decisions so that we give not only certainties to the, the landowners, but also certainly the companies that when they go through the process of reclamation, it's going to be final and they'll be able to move on to other projects. I think we owe it to everybody to get that, that process clarified. Yeah, collaborative effort. Now, your government is spending around $8 million on the ad campaign called Tell the Feds. This is apparently fighting back against the Liberals' clean energy regulations. And you're warning that many people may be in the dark this winter? Well, I can tell you in Alberta, we might be the the early warning sign, because for years we would go and only have maybe one critical alert in a, a season or one every couple of years. We've had eight level three alerts in the last year, and that means that our power grid is close to failure it's to the point where they actually shed people off the grid so that they can maintain the stability. Uh, we've seen this in other in other countries. We've seen it in Germany. We've seen it in Texas. And I can tell you, we, we simply can't put up with it happening here. And part of the reason is that the federal government created so much uncertainty around investing. One of the reasons is the act that was just declared unconstitutional, but it's also the pronouncements that they're making on trying to achieve unrealistic, now unconstitutional targets way too early. Uh, the uh, federal environment minister, Stephen Gibault, has talked about a net zero power grid by 2035. And I can tell you, it's simply not possible in this province. 90% of our electricity comes from natural gas. We already made a substantial multi-billion dollar investment of phasing off coal seven years early. And we need to make sure that we don't have any more stranded assets. We also need to make sure 
that we are keeping up with the growth in population. We're expecting that our uh, demand for electricity is going to double between now and 2050. And we need to bring on secu secure supply of baseload power to make sure that the grid doesn't fail. So that that's my objective. And I think we now have the constitutional authority to proceed with that. Simply cannot let Albertans be in danger of uh, having an unreliable grid, an unaffordable grid. And we wanted to make sure that the rest of the country understood just how dire it was for us. You know, you talk about uh, power outages. I remember living in southern Ontario and Ajax and Hamilton. We used to have rolling brownouts all the time. Just be prepared. You're not going to have any power for like two to three days. It was, it was incredible. The opposition NDP here in the province has said that our relationship with Ottawa really needs to get better and not so combative so that the two governments can work better together. Now, how can you really have a healthy working relationship with the Trudeau Liberals while also standing up for Albertans, Premier Smith? Well, I have to tell you, like the NDP allowed for uh, the cons the uh, constitution to be to be violated with Bill C forty eight, Bill C sixty nine, and they did nothing about it. It took us getting into uh, office to fight back against it. And thank heavens we did. Otherwise, we'd still have this unconstitutional act that would be governing our affairs. So I don't think the NDP has any credibility. And my view is I have engaged in cooperative federalism from the very first phone call that I had with Justin Trudeau. I told him I wanted to work with him on carbon neutrality targets by, by 2050. I, I told him we were going to create an emissions reduction plan. We did, we released that in April. I asked him if he would work with us at a joint table so that we could come to some agreement about what the milestones should be along the way. And my DMs are in Ottawa as we speak. Um, meeting with them to try to come to those agreements. We had a great relationship during the fires. They were very helpful in making sure that First Nations communities um, had the evacuation support that they needed, the rebuilding support that they needed. They assisted us with the Canadian Armed Forces uh, fighting. And we also signed a $24 billion health care deal that will confirm that uh, we uh, were upholding the principles of the Canada Health Act. So yes, we can work collaboratively. The federal government has to stop picking fights with us. That's the key. If they stop picking fights with us, then we won't have to fight back. We we can engage in a spirit of cooperation, but we need a willing partner at the table. And uh, they, on cer certain issues, have not been a, a willing or very collaborative partner. We had federal conservative leader Pierre Polyev on our program a few months ago, and we talked extensively about the carbon tax and how it's hurting Canadians. What are you seeing about the impact of the federal carbon tax here in our province in Alberta? Oh. It's, it's doubly devastating because we rely so much on natural gas to heat our homes. And so when, when people get the, the double whammy of needing to keep their lights on longer in the wintertime as well as heat their homes, they're, they're getting massive bills. And uh, the number of people have told me that they're their carbon tax bill is oftentimes larger than the, the base cost of gas. That's yeah. the, the the reality of what um, our, our people here are facing. So I'm supportive of uh, Pierre Polyev's view that we shouldn't have a retail carbon tax. I think that the great emissions reduction is going to happen with our industrial players, with the oil sands pathways group planning to be net zero by 2050, a petrochar petrochemical project, Dow Chemical, um, talking about net zero petrochemical industry, air products, a, a net zero hydrogen facility, even uh, Heidelberg is a, a cement uh, factory. They they are building the first net zero cement factory in Edmonton next year. Those are the things that are going to make dramatic emissions reductions. In addition, making sure that we export more clean LNG so that we can replace coal and wood and other polluting fuels internationally. Those are the things that are going to make a major difference. Punishing seniors Low-income people, the most vulnerable, in the dead of winter in January, it's not fair, it's not right. And that's why we uh, we believe that the retail carbon tax has got to go. Finance Minister Nate Horner says if our province does abandon the Canada Pension Plan for an Alberta-made version, it will not adopt Quebec's model. So, Premier Smith, how will Alberta's version be different? I think people need to... To, to first make the decision about whether they want us to have an Alberta pension plan. That's what the reason, I mean, we've had this conversation going on in our province for as long as I can remember. I remember 2001, the firewall letter was written by uh, professors at the University of Calgary, including Stephen Harper, who became prime minister, talking about uh, how do we assert the rights in Alberta the same way Quebec has. Quebec has a pension plan. They have their own uh, collection of taxes. They have their own police force. They manage their own immigration. And so this conversation has been going on for a very long time in Alberta. My predecessor started the process with the Fair Deal panel. The Albertans asked for us to do an analysis. The analysis was done. We've released it. And now it's up to Albertans to tell us if they want to if they want to move forward and uh, and develop our own pension plan. We wanted them to know what we're entitled to under the act because we overpay 
and those dollars have compounded. We'd be entitled to $334 billion on the basis of uh, the, the formula that's in statute. And that would allow for us to reduce premiums by $1,400 on employers and employees, as well as increase the amount of money that we're able to, to give to seniors. But it is up to them. And so that's uh, part of the reason why we put it forward to them. How the money gets invested would be a secondary consideration. I think the main thing that the finance minister was pointing out is that these decisions aren't going to be made by politicians. When you, when you do set up, especially something as important as pension, because we do manage a huge amount of pension assets already, we, we have to make sure that we have an independent board of advisors that are managing the assets for the, the best returns of the, of the rate payers. Politicians really shouldn't be involved in those decisions. So referendum is forthcoming? A refer if we if we get some positive feedback from Albertans okay. that they want a referendum, we will we will know very soon. I mean, our first town hall had twelve thousand people on it, and we're continuing to get uh, uh, feedback coming in on from all sources on the website through our survey. We'll have a pretty good idea of whether Albertans want it to go to a vote, um, and the, I'll let the panel finish their work. They're going to report back to us in May, and, and we'll know what uh, what the path forward is at that point. There are a number of Albertans who are upset that you allegedly dropped your promise to enshrine protections for the unvaccinated in human rights legislation. Now, didn't you actually campaign on that before? Why the change of heart? It wasn't the right way to do it. And I was persuaded of that by, by my caucus. I mean, part of what you do when you're a leader is you put forward ideas. And then part of what you do when you become premier is you have to listen to your team around you. And so they wanted us to, to take a bit, a bit more time in looking at the, the ways that we could do those protections. So I asked Preston Manning if he would do a, a study on that. His, it's, a, it's almost complete. Uh, I'm intent I think he's intending to give me the, the final report by the middle of November, at which point we'll make it public. And it, it goes through in great detail. I've asked him through the terms of reference to look at all the ways in which we can make sure that we manage the, the pandemic uh, in the future better than we did in the past and make sure that we protect rights. But what I will say is that I made it very clear when I, I got elected that I believe that these are private medical decisions, that people should talk to their doctor, make their own personal choice. Um, it was my expectation that people would not be discriminated against. I, I made that, that, uh, that expectation very clear to my own government to the business community. And uh, from what I can see, that is being respected in Alberta, and I'm glad for that. The AHS brought back mask mandates for health care facilities across Alberta, including acute care facilities. Many people would argue that the masks, they really don't help much, and people still get the viruses. Your thoughts on the move by AHS? Well, AHS does operate 106 facilities on our behalf, and they are taking what I think uh, they believe is a measured response in, in looking at the amount of outbreaks that are happening in a facility. What I would say is anyone should make the choice on whether or not they think a, a mask is going to be protective to them. But I have told them that I my expectation is no patient is uh, is going to be denied service. We, we have to make sure that people get the, the care that they need. The main thing is uh, we're in respiratory virus season. We've got COVID, we've got influenza, we've got RSV. I think the, the uh, recommendations still stand. If you're sick, stay home. Make sure that you're washing your hands frequently. Uh, keep socially distanced if you if you are feeling a bit under the weather, and and just make sure you take care of yourself. That's that's what I think people need to do. And perhaps a, a mask is an indication that somebody might be a little bit under the weather. So maybe just uh, keep a little bit of distance to keep yourself safe. The One Million March for Children grabbed international headlines. Many people are really upset that SOGI, or sexual orientation and gender identity, is being used by teachers as a tool or resource in schools. Now, SOGI obviously is not part of the Alberta school curriculum. But Premier Smith, let me ask you, will it be in the future? I'm watching what's happening in other jurisdictions, uh, and I'm very, con you know, I, I'm acknowledging the concern that parents have. Parents, quite rightly, want to be involved in their kids' lives. They, they don't want secrets being kept from them. At the same time, we, we also know that uh, kids who are going through a lot of confusion around puberty, gender identity, they also need to, to feel safe and supported. So we're trying to figure out what the right balance would be and watching what's happening in other jurisdictions to, to make sure that we are, are doing uh, any legislation in a way that, that uh, respects everybody. So we, we haven't made a decision on that yet. We've got uh, some motions that are going to be de debated at our upcoming AGM. We've had caucus discussions. We're seeing what's happening in other jurisdictions. And if it if we feel like we need to, to move on legislation, then, then we'll make that decision at a future point. We've seen a real housing crisis in many regions of the country, including right here in our province. So what's being done to create more affordable housing so a young family can actually purchase a home of their very own? 
there's a, we're trying to use two terms. So affordable housing has traditionally meant subsidized housing for our most vulnerable. And we have a, a number of programs, a billion dollars over the next three years that we're spending in support of that. But attainable housing is, I think, the other big aspect that we're, we're trying to support, especially when we've seen these rising interest rates and we've, we've seen ballooning housing prices in other parts of the country. We still have a relatively affordable market, but we have to make sure it stays that way because more and more people are coming here. One of the reasons for that is you can actually have the dream of home ownership at a reasonable rate. So um, we're working with the municipalities to identify ways that we can accelerate those kinds of projects. For instance, and I hope we can hear more of this, I talked to a recent council member in uh, in Calgary who told me with two transportation projects, if we could partner with them on approving those, that would open up 20,000 um, lots for development for single family homes. So I would put the, 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 uh, the challenge out to Lethbridge, to Medicine Hat, to uh, Red Deer, Grand Prairie, Fort McMurray, Calgary, and Edmonton. If you can come forward with those, with those kinds of projects, ideas that will really open up the private sector to start accelerating some of that construction, we're, we're here to be a partner. Alberta Premier Daniel Smith, thanks so much for your time today and for joining us from Calgary. Well, thanks for having me. Nice to talk to you.